One of the best draft resources on the planet is Dane Brugler's Beast. Let's talk with the guy himself, Dane Brugler, about all things related to this Bengals 2024 draft. You are Locked On Bengals, your daily Cincinnati Bengals podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up and welcome in to another edition of the Locked On Bengals podcast. He's Jake Lisko. I'm James Rapine, and today's show is brought to you by LinkedIn. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. And Jake, you mentioned it. Dane Brugler is joining us. Make sure you hit that subscribe button on YouTube. Follow wherever you get your podcasts. And thank you so much for making us your first listen. Without further ado, let's get to him. Dane Brugler of The Athletic joins us right now on Locked on Bengals. Glad to welcome back onto the show, The Athletics, Dane Brugler, the author of The Beast Draft Guide, which many of us, myself included, have been reading for over a decade now. And Dane, we appreciate your expertise every year. This year, excited to talk about a lot of first round topics, but we'll talk about depth as well. We're going to start with some offensive tackle conversation. Obviously, a big focus for the Cincinnati Bengals is finding a long term right tackle, a rare opportunity for them to find near the top of the draft, more so than they've been the last couple of years, a more athletic player, perhaps, or just youth at a position where they've been going with stop gaps, it seems for the entirety of Joe Burrow's career. So let me ask you this question to start. How many tackles do you think actually make it to 18? Because I've seen five and six tackles drafted in the top, depending on who you think is a tackle, drafted in the top 17 picks. And so how likely is it that we, we've talked up this opportunity that might not even happen? Will there be a top tackle available to the Bengals, do you think? That's the big question, right? Um, I, I've got my seven-round mock draft coming out this week. And let me look here. I've got... So Alt will be off the board in this mock. J.C. Latham, Fuaga, Foshnu, and then if we if we include Troy Fa, uh, Fautanu from Washington in, in that group as well, so that's what six um, offensive tackles that are off the board in this scenario, uh, or five. One, two, three, four, five, five. So five offensive tackles off the board. Um, it seems realistic. I mean, I think a lot of teams obviously need offensive line help. Um, this is a draft where I do think there's a, a pretty steep drop-off. Maybe not steep, but the options dwindle once you get to day two. Uh, there are some quality tackles that I think will go on day two, but not as many. The volume isn't there. And so if you don't get your tackle early in the first round, you're kind of crossing your fingers and toes, hoping that one of those tackles fall to you or you can make a move to go get one of those tackles in the second round. It becomes a little more of a uh, uh, risky proposition. So um, I do think we'll see tackles fly off the board. And, and so in this scenario, if let's just say uh, Mims and Guyton are available at 18, two guys that are right tackles uh, you know, by nature. That's the position they played in college. But what is the the Bengals especially? What is their projection for them in terms of getting on the field? And uh, you know, do they view them as developmental type of players? Do they feel like they're going to be able to start if if needed due to injury from you know in in their year one as their rookie season, or do they view them more as? projects and it's going to take a year maybe more than that before they really feel comfortable with them earning a starting job so even though i think their talent warrants the pick the Bengals are in a spot where no the, the, the holes they address for free agency they don't have to necessarily find a starting right tackle from day one but at the same time you want someone that's going to be able to contribute pretty early in their rookie or in their NFL careers so what does their evaluate evaluation look like for those two players that that's kind of i think a question mark that we're still struggling with on the outside looking in yeah for sure and let's talk a little bit more about Amarius Mims because i, I think yeah. it's easy to to fall in love with all of the traits and yet i think a lot of our listeners are, are scared to death of the Bengals taking Amarius Mims because of the lack of experience and the injuries. Where are you at with that? We don't know exactly where the Bengals are, but yeah. I think he's pretty unique where in, in some drafts, especially if he did play more, would have been a top 10 guy, top eight guy. And instead mm -hmm. he could realistically be there at 18. 
I think there's a big difference between being raw and inexperienced. And I think he is much more inexperienced than he is raw as a player. Um, I, the first start he ever made, you go back to the Ohio State game last year in the college football playoffs, he was outstanding. I mean, he, he, a lot of things that he was doing looked very natural for him. Um, so I think once you start to g gain that experience, now that's the thing that you struggle with because eight starts to his name, obviously, that's, that's not great. And when you get to the NFL – you're going to get more reps in terms of uh, in in game reps, but there's going to be mistakes inevitably along the way. Can you survive with him, your right tackle, making those mistakes and without getting your quarterback killed, so he can build up uh, that mental resume uh, of just understanding what is coming at him and what he needs to do to adjust and make plays. So yeah, I I struggle with him because he is one of the most fascinating players in this draft. If if we look back on this draft four years from now, and he is the top tackle from this class, I don't think it'd be surprising. I mean, he's six eight, three hundred forty pounds. Uh, I've never seen a human look quite like him before. He's so it, it, there's not any bad weight on him. It, it looks all he carries it so well. I've never seen three hundred forty pounds carried so well and he moves well he's got outstanding length a huge huge hands uh but obviously there's you have to have faith in him as a player as a person um and that he's going to continue to get better and live up to this this high ceiling so fans that are maybe a little bit scared of the pick i, I don't even the fans that the, the biggest Amarius Mims supporters, I don't know how you can't be just a, not a little bit worried and scared of the pick because there is clear bust potential here, but there's also clear hit potential, uh, what he could be. And so, you know, I, I know Amarius Mims has been, he's met with the Bengals on more than, more than a few times. And these interviews are probably huge. Uh, understanding what he sees, his mental makeup, what he, X's and O's wise, just understanding where he is in his in his development, um, and but just understanding him as a person to get to know him better. How hard of a worker is he going to be? Uh, you know, because there will be injuries here and there, but can he play through pain? Can he work back? Missing some time due to injuries that was a part of his college story. So, Marius Mims, yeah, we we could talk on and on about him and just all the back and forth that I think teams are going through as they build their board and you know how, where to stick him on their board um a, a lot of a lot of back and forth I don't think there'll be any consensus on the player it'll come down to a GM having to really make his money and, and understanding okay what well, this is worth the risk or it's not and, and I think the Bengals are probably having those uh, internal discussions right now Today's show is brought to you by LinkedIn. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are the are right for the role. And that's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. Maybe this is what the Bengals should do at Nose Tackle, which we're about to get into uh, with Dane. Uh, LinkedIn isn't just a job board. It helps you hire professionals that you can't find anywhere else. Over 70% of LinkedIn users don't visit other leading job sites. They're on LinkedIn. You want to find them. You want to find the best candidates. And that's why 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. Hire professionals like a professional on LinkedIn and post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. And thinking about whether the team fit is appropriate too, right? Where Trent Brown is your right tackle penciled in mm -hmm. right now, but he's finished about 33% of his NFL career, NFL seasons. And so if you need a guy that maybe he's only going to have half a season to develop, talking about that development curve for Marius Mims, do the Bengals think he'll be ready in that time? And you're right. We could talk about a Marius Mims for, for a pretty long time. And I'm sure you have, you're doing great work with, uh, with Nate and, and with Robert on the athletic podcast as well, leading up to the draft, I've really been enjoying those where you have some of those deeper conversations as well. You hit a lot of the talking points we've had for Marius Vince. Carries that weight, unlike any player we've seen carrying that amount of weight, has an incredible build, a unique, singular build in a lot of ways. The ceiling and floor that we've talked about on this podcast, a huge range of outcomes there. Another player that I think carries similar question marks for different reasons is J.C. Latham, and, and I guess this is a question. Do teams see a player like J.C. Latham where the film is there, but there are athleticism questions, and then he opts out of testing? What's the reaction to that for a prospect like J.C. Latham where 
for fair or not, and I would say not, there's also a reputation for Alabama tackles that that has been discussed on social media recently. Yeah, I, obviously Evan Neal not working out uh, with the Giants so far, being a top 10 pick. And, I mean, yeah, there, there have been quite a few. But, yeah, Latham's tough because the, he has good tape, and I think you could make the argument he is the strongest player in the draft. And is he the best athlete? No, but I think he's a functional athlete. Now, not having the, the testing information to uh, you know, really – make comparisons uh, between uh, these other tackles, uh, making comparisons with past tackles that have worked in the NFL, guys that haven't. It, it's a data point that's missing. And for some teams, that'll matter more than others. Um, other teams that you know really believe in the tape, I they think they'll be okay because they understand that he's not a great athlete, but he's a functional athlete. And you know he, he, he put good f- uh, performance on film, uh, especially the last two years. So I, I think for a team that is looking for a smash mouth run game, a guy that uh, is going to control defenders at the point of attack. Uh, they, they're going to speak differently. You know, for example, say say the Chargers move back from five to eleven or somewhere in the teens. J.C. Latham has to be an appealing player because of what he brings in the run game. Um, and obviously, you know, Jim Harbaugh is he understands who Latham is, coached against them, recruited him, all that kind of thing. So, you know, Latham, I think, is just a little bit different of a story because he has the the tools. Another guy that's over 340 pounds, another guy, 35-inch arms, 11-inch hands. I mean, he's just a massive, massive player. And when he gets his hands on you, it is over. It just does he have the range that you're looking for on the outside to survive on an island. Uh, is he a clean guard uh, in, to convert if, if that's what you want to do? So, yeah, he, he's a, a player with a lot of question marks. Um, he, he's not a clean evaluation. And for, uh, but again, when we, especially when we're talking about the Bengals, they're picking 18th. So, obviously, a player falling to you, there's a reason for it. And, it, and there's not, probably not going to be a lot of clean evaluations when you're drafting at 18 overall. You have to sacrifice something, whether it's taking a leap of faith on a player uh, like a Marius Mims or overlooking the lack of testing from maybe a J.C. Latham. So I, I think that comes with picking in the back half of round one where you're either taking a lesser player or you're taking a player with a ton of talent, but there might be a glaring question mark. And you just have to figure out and be okay with okay, what are we going to bet on? Uh, is it going to be the lack of testing? Is it going to be the lack of starts like an Amarius Mims? So that that does make for some really interesting philosoph- uh, philosophical questions uh, from team to team, how they look at it a little bit differently. Dane, let's stick with the trenches and go from offensive tackle to defensive tackle because while there could be a run on offensive tackles, I think there's maybe two defensive tackles that'll go in the first round, certainly one in Byron Murphy yeah. How big of the gap is there between a Byron Murphy and a Johnny Newton? And, and do you think Byron might be there at pick 18? That might be one of my favorite fits uh, would be Byron Murphy to 18 uh, in Cincinnati. I think it's probably, I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's, it's likely, but I think there's a good chance of, of him being there. Um, I know the Seahawks like him a lot. Uh, 16's possible. Um, there are some teams in the top 15 that really like him, but it still feels like it might be a stretch if they took him over one of these corners or a Dallas Turner. So I think it's it's realistic uh, that Byron Murphy would be there at 18. And now, is he the longest player? No. Uh, you, 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 the lack of length uh, some teams might struggle with. Uh, he doesn't look necessarily the lack of height, so he doesn't necessarily look like um, a first round defensive tackle. But not all of them do. Obviously, you know I'm not going to compare him to Aaron Donald, but you know that's the poster child for not really looking the way you're supposed to. But uh, you know he's able to uh, obviously have a good NFL career um, with uh, Byron Murphy. You, I think you're really encouraged by the fact that. He shows up versus the run in the pass. He's not specialized in one single area. He's explosive. He understands how to use his leverage. Uh, he he has this twitch through his hips that I just you don't see from other defensive tackles in this class, in my opinion. So I do. Th- I, I'm a big fan of Johnny Newton as well. I think Johnny Newton's a really good player, but I do think there's a clear difference between him and Byron Murphy. Um, I think 
Johnny Newton should be a first round pick. I think he's going to be a quality NFL player, but I do think that Byron Murphy is the better prospect, the better player. Uh, and, and again, I think it's the power that he plays with the athleticism um, and the fact that he shows up versus the pass and the run and he's productive in both areas. There's this, I guess, interesting comparison between those two specific players where Byron Murphy at Texas played a lot of nose tackle. And Johnny mm. Newton's playing the position where you expect him to play in the NFL much more at Illinois. How does that fit into the projection? I, I think it's difficult with tackles, too. Something you mentioned with Latham, how often is he challenged to get out wide? And, and just like right. that with these defensive ta- – any offensive tackle in the college game anymore, I guess. How much are they actually dealing with wide alignments? But also with these defensive tackles, is that a challenging projection? Or, or how do you approach that when you have a guy who's – playing kind of a different role in Byron Murphy than you think he's likely to play in the NFL. Is it just a bonus because he can hold up at nose and he, and he's shown that, or does that make it harder to project the the three tech fit? Yeah, I consider it a bonus. I mean, I consider it, Hey, we've seen him do it. We don't have to project. Can he line up as a one technique or a nose? Uh, you know, he can control the a gap and still make plays. Um, Heck, we saw him on offense. He scored twice uh, this past year. So throw him in on goal line situations as well. So the more you can do, the more you put on tape, that that's great. Because uh, if I've seen you do it once, I know you can do it. And consistency might not be there. But the fact that you have shown on tape that you can do it now, okay, this is why we pay the coaches all that money. Uh, the, he, he's shown he can do it. Now it's up to the coaches to get more consistency out of him. So we, with Murphy, I, I the the pass rush that he showed this year when he was allowed to pass rush, um, did he benefit by lining up next to Tavondre Sweat? Sure, there's no doubt about that. But I've seen him beat enough blockers to have a good feeling about projecting to the next level and the way he fires off the ball, the way they uses his hands, the way he can leverage gaps, uh, do all the things that you want your defensive tackle to do, whether he is lined up over the B gap or the A gap. Um, I, I feel comfortable that he can be that interchangeable defensive tackle so he can be on the field in any situation. He can be on the field on any down. And ideally, in a, in a first round defensive tackle, that's what you're looking for. A, a guy that has the high end traits, but also has the versatility to play multiple spots up front, and you don't have to hide him in a certain situation. We've all been there, either as a player or as a fan, certainly in Jake's case, as a player, elite athlete. It's halftime, and the scoreboard is not looking good. You're feeling low, not sure if you or your team can pull out a win. That's when you dig deep. Lift your head up and say to yourself, time to get back in the game, pull off some bank heists, and take as much of my friend's money as I possibly can. That sounds like Trey Waynes. That also sounds like Jake Lisko and James Rapino. Monopoly Go lets you compete with your friends to get the most riches and the biggest empire. It's the Monopoly you love, but on your phone anytime with tons of new twists, including leaderboards to compare your progress to your buddies. You can play on countless dynamic Monopoly boards. You can even work with your friends to crack open community chests and in tournaments to get extra rewards and climb the leaderboard. So get back out there, put on your game face, and download Monopoly Go now free on the App Store or Google Play. Dane, is the is there a similar drop off at defensive tackle that there is at offensive tackle, specifically with the 18th pick? So whatever realistic OT that could be there at 18 versus what could be there on day two for the Bengals versus defensive tackles and potentially landing Byron Murphy versus what they could get on day two. I actually, I kind of like the defensive tackle depth on day two. I just, I just think there's like offensive tackle. I have a lot more questions about the, um, Kingsley Sua Matias and the Patrick Pauls and the Roger Rosengarden, the Blake Fishers. I think those guys can very well end up being NFL starters and solid NFL players, but I have more questions about those guys than I do that next tier of defensive tackles where, you know, we're going to see Chris Jenkins go from Michigan, go somewhere probably in the top 50. Uh, Mike Hall from Ohio State. He's kind of the Amarius Mims of on defense, on the defensive line. Uh, not size-wise, they're very different size-wise. But in terms of uh, playing, uh, the, the number of snaps they've played at the college level, Mike Hall is one of the youngest players in the draft, still just 20 years old. Um, has whether it was injury related or just part of the defensive line rotation the Buckeyes had, 
he doesn't have a ton of snaps played, but when he was on the field, he made plays. He was very disruptive, and for a guy that's that, you know, he's three hundred, right around three hundred pounds, just underneath it, but still ran a four seven five. I had one scout tell me that he wanted to see Mike Hall lose weight and be a linebacker because he just moved so so well. He thought he'd be uh, a first round center if he really wanted to be. Uh, but we we wow. have him a defensive tackle, and I think that he, when you look at the movement skills, you think of how disruptive he can be. There's optimism there. It just it's going to take a little bit of time for him to be more consistent versus the run and to build up those those snaps that he is missing from his resume. Uh, you think about Mason Smith from LSU. The, what does the NFL want? They want six five, three hundred pounds, and those types are in short supply this year. So that's why Mason Smith, who you look at the film and it's up and down, it's inconsistent, but you grade to the flashes and you look at the body type and say. Hey, I, this is the type of guy that we want. Let's we'll coach him up, and so he's going to go probably somewhere in that second round. Braden Fisk is in there. Braden Dorless from Oregon, uh, Makai Wingo, LSU, uh, Ruka Roro from Clemson. So it's a defensive tackle class that I, I think the day two depth. We're only going to see one, maybe two, go in the first round, but that day two defensive tackle depth is uh, I, I think maybe a strength of uh, you know one of these uh, of, of all these defensive positions. The day two defensive tackles I think is a strength. I like this this analogy that's formed in my head where you compare Michael Hall, the defensive tackle of Amarius Mims, his offensive tackle, and then Mason Smith to me is then Tyler Guyton, where you've got the guy mm. that also has limited snaps and has some work to do, but you can see the traits and he has a body type and all these things. That just stood out to me. We've got Mason Smith at 944 college snaps and, and Michael Hall at 714. And one thing I noticed when you're talking about these defensive tackles, Dane, is that uh, none of them weigh more than 300 pounds. And yeah. the Bengals have this nose tackle need. DJ Reader's out. Sheldon Rankins is in. Sheldon Rankins can play some nose for you. BJ Hill can play some nose for you, but neither of those guys are your goal line package nose tackles, certainly. And the Bengals don't have a nose tackle on the roster right now, period. But this nose tackle class, you go look at the beast, and your highest graded nose tackle, I believe, is Tavondre Sweat, and you got a fourth round grade there. A guy like McKinley Jackson, who we've talked about as an early day three option you've got a six seven on and yeah. and i don't recall there being anyone that's a nose tackle type that you're particularly excited about what's that about where, where are the nose tackles where are they coming out of college football where have they got i was hoping you would tell me uh i mean how would we feel if uh byron murphy in the first to andre sweat in the fourth team those guys back up how, how if that's how it happened oh yeah on draft weekend how are we feeling about that I, i'm on board personally our listeners yeah. would love it. I I think sweat. I don't think the Bengals draft sweat before their first sixth round. I think they're all the way okay. out probably on him. Just just yeah, because that's... the Dewan Jones is, and they've just not shown interest in that. That's well, all. They, Even though he is had, talented, of course. They had him in for that mm -hmm. thirty visit, and then the next week we we get the DWI, and so that's probably that's... troubling for them. That's tough when the DWI was after the thirty visit. Yeah, because yeah. You know, and I. And I tweeted a little bit about this um, with Sweat. It, he kind of had a reputation as an underclassman, as a guy that loved the party. And it, it was not until his senior year that he really focused in and said, all right, let's 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 turn this around. This is, my, And that worries you, obviously, when it, you are skating along and then, okay, when it really matters, that's when I'll show up. Okay, is that what's going to happen in the NFL? You're going to skate along until it's a contract year? And so – I there are major questions about focus with the player. Um, you know, his weight obviously being a part of that. In, in the national champion or the college football semifinals, he was close to 390. And it's like if you want to play at a high, high level in the NFL, uh, you just have to take better care of your body and stay conditioned. Now, I 360, 370, like that's for most people, that's obviously overweight for him it's it's not too troubling because he carries it so well but uh yeah I, I think he's he's a really tough evaluation because he's he has made it a point throughout this interview process to convince teams that hey i've turned over a new leaf i'm you know this more mature player now but then you make the decision that you did and a dwi by itself is obviously terrible the fact that you made that judgment three weeks before the biggest day of your life that's something that uh, plays into this as well. So yeah, I have. I don't think he's going top 100. It's just a matter of where on day three does a team feel comfortable 
drafting him and i i I have no idea when that's going to be what team it's going to be but yeah the the Bengals are an interesting team there because like you said uh nose tackles in need how well did that interview go uh, on that 30 visit um where did would they feel comfortable uh taking that risk and rolling the dice i it's kind of guesswork at this point as we go into day three I'll tell you, they'll draft a nose tackle. They've they've also talked to McKinley Jackson. They ha- they hosted McKinley Jackson. They hosted Evan Anderson. They hosted Justin Rogers. All these nose tackles they've talked to yeah. at some point. Sorry, James. And, and what's interesting now is is obviously Sweat's the most talented, but they have to figure out is it worth that risk at what wherever it, it, you have to take him. Probably one fifteen, right? Probably their fourth rounder, Probably. or take one of those other guys around the same time. I, I think that's the dynamic. The, or the debate, at least, that they're having this week, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that, and that's it, it, that's tough because this you you're right. The nose tackles this year are just it's a it's a lacking position, and mm-hmm. ideally, yeah, you want to draft one of these guys, and yeah, if you can get McKinley Jackson in six round, you know, maybe that's the risk you take um, as opposed to a, to Vondra Sweat in the fourth, um, or you know, Justin Rogers. I, I can't imagine he's going to go higher than the sixth, so sixth or seventh round. You, you know, that's the dart throw. But is he exactly what you're looking for? Um, can he play the position as a rookie? Can he give? How many snaps is he going to give you? So uh, this is not a great year to be needing a nose tackle in the draft. No, I, I agree with that. They do love their captains as well. McKinley Jackson, a two-time captain. Evan Anderson, Chris Boyd, both captains as well. As noted in the Beast, that's where we get that information that we track because it is important to the Bengals. And, and we appreciate that you track that for us, Dane. Let's let's pivot. Let's talk about some skill guys. Let's talk about some wide receivers, some day two wide receivers. There, there's some Brian Thomas hype for some Bengals fans, but I don't think the Bengals are particularly interested in most scenarios in a first-round wide receiver, even if one is available to them. Mm-hmm. Something we're interested in on this podcast are inside outside versatile wide receivers guys that will allow the Bengals to put Jamar chase wherever they want to. And maybe that's just because they had a slot only type in Tyler Boyd for so long. How do you see the day two group of wide receivers for like the the best inside outside versatile kind of guys? I think Ricky Pearsall from Florida is probably the best of that group. Um, Strictly talking about inside outside can work all over the formation um, has really sticky hands, but also a really good athlete. So he's not quite a possession receiver. He's not quite, uh, you know, a vertical threat, not slot only, not outside. He's kind of a little bit of everything mixed in the one. And I think that that only helps his case in terms of going uh, early. Um, now, I don't, I don't think he makes it to the Bengals second round pick. And so is this like a trade situation? I don't know because it, you're not taking him at 18. Uh, but yeah, you know, Ricky Pearsall would be interesting. Um, after him, I mean, who else? You know, maybe a Jalen Polk from Washington. You know, maybe he could be in that mix. It depends on what you think of Malachi Corley as being more than just what the tape showed from Western Kentucky. He was, you know, that underneath receiver who just get the ball in his hands, manufacture touches, and let him go create. Uh, but do you see more? from him um, uh, at, at the next level uh, than just what he put on tape. That could be the answer to whether or not you know he, he would fit in this category. Jermaine Burton from Alabama, it could also fit in there. He's got his own question marks, but could end up being a steal. Um, maybe a Javon Baker as well kind of fits in that same category. So yeah, this is a receiver-rich draft. Uh, first round, obviously, at the top, but then in the, in the rest of the first round, the back half of the first round, day two, day three, uh, we're we're going to see a lot of receivers fly off the board. Tight end, not as rich. One guy that we've discussed uh, a ton, and, and Bengals fans love the idea of him falling to 18, is yeah. Brock Bowers. What are the odds he falls? And outside of Brock Bowers, how steep is the fall off behind him? I'd be shocked. He's just too good. Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah. I, the, he's too good. The, the Colts at 15, to me, that's yeah. got to be his, his kind of ceiling of where he would fall. He's just too good. That plain and simple, and because uh, he's not I, I, the the T and the E next to each other scares people away. I get it, but he's not just a tight end. I mean, he's a slot receiver. He's he's a do everything guy, 
And as long as you have faith in your offensive coordinator, that he's going to understand how to use that. I would not be uh, scared at all to, to draft a Brock Bowers uh, early in the draft. And so you think of the Jets at 10, the Broncos at 12, the Colts at 15. I'd be surprised if he doesn't go to one of those three spots. If he lasts, lasts 18, it's a no-brainer. Um, after that, yeah, there is definitely a drop-off. And I think we, you know, we're talking more third round before mm-hmm. – we talk about the next tight end, whether it's Jatavion Sanders or Theo Johnson or Jared Wiley, um, Ben Sinnott, um, uh, Cage Stover, Ohio State. I, I think there's some some solid tight end options. Um, you know, I think obviously the the way the Bengals treat the position is more stopgap options, um, and, and then you know try to develop somebody through the draft. And so I don't think they're necessarily looking for someone that's going to hit the ground running and be a rookie of the year candidate by any means. But uh, there are some, some quality options. Once you get to the third round, fourth round, um, you know, even a tip Ryman from Illinois, I think is going to go somewhere in that, you know, fourth round range and, and be a, a solid developmental player. Tanner McLaughlin from Arizona. So this isn't, if you need a starter at tight end, then this is not quite the year for you. But if you're looking for more of a depth piece, someone that can continue, continue to develop into something. This is a pretty solid tight end group. We know the Bengals really like Sam Laporte and Dalton Kincaid last year. So if you could quickly one through four Bowers, Laporta, Kincaid pits as prospects coming out. How do you see those guys? I mean, strictly as prospects um, I, to me, Bowers and pits would be one, two, two, one or whatever order. And they're, they're kind of tough. Uh, yeah. They're very different players, but yeah. they'd be at the top. Um, and then Kincaid, then Laporta. Uh, I mean, Laporta's made me look n- not smart because he's he outplayed where I had. I mean, I liked him. He's a solid second round pick, and you know, but he's played well above you know what I thought he would be. And, and credit to him because he's what he's done for that Detroit offense has been awesome to watch. Yeah, that's what I thought about it too. But the Bengals love those guys. Can tell you that yeah. for sure. Last year, didn't get the opportunity to pick them. Dane, we appreciate the time and expertise as always. Go check out the Beast at the Athletic. Great stuff that we've been using for years and we'll continue to use into the future. Dane, always appreciate it. That was my pleasure. Thanks, guys. Really good stuff there from Dane Brugler. Always enjoy having him on. And he's as busy as anyone this time of year. Of course, we're busy too right here on Locked on Bengals. In fact, this week we have two more shows, including Joe Goodberry, who's going to join us. And then on Wednesday night on Cincinnati Bengals Talk, we're going to Try to create the Bengals draft board because that's what they're doing this week. It starts at 8 Eastern, and so we'll see you there. And then on Locked on Bengals, we're going to react to that board, whether we agree or disagree, because it's going to be a roundtable. So join us then and join us all week long right here on Locked on Bengals. For Jake Lisko, I'm James Erpine. As always, thank you so much for listening to the Locked on Bengals podcast.